Good evening and welcome to Quorum. I'm Wilson Stribling. Our topic tonight is public health and we have lots of ground to cover. In a moment, I'll introduce the chairman and vice chairs of the House and Senate Public Health Committees. Not only do they oversee a wide body of legislation in support of health and wellness in Mississippi, they must also steer critical funding to health agencies and programs affecting people across the state of Mississippi. A quick look at the stats explains why public health is such a critical issue in Mississippi. Consider the latest overview by the Kaiser Family Foundation. The group catalogs health data for each state. It finds that Mississippians have an average life expectancy of less than 74 years. That's four years shorter than the nationwide average. Almost 68% of all Mississippians are considered obese. Almost 23% of our residents smoke. Our teen pregnancy rate is 24 points above the national rate, and our infant mortality rate is 10.6, one of the worst in the country. Our hospitals, including the University Medical Center in Jackson, are among the best in the region, but those and other health facilities are few and far between for many Mississippians, both geographically and financially. More than 510,000 people have no health insurance coverage. That's 18% of the state. 17% of Mississippians get Medicare benefits, and 26% draw support from Medicaid. About 58% of that population are children. Uh, the rest are disabled and blind people. The federal government stepped in during the, the depth of the recession and helped states to meet their match quota for the Medicaid program as well as some other agencies. Uh, those funds have gone away and so we'll, we'll be matching our Medicaid dollars at the same rate that we normally would have, which is about 25 cents that the state puts up. The federal government's responsible for about 75 percent. Providing more access to health insurance is on the legislature's short list of priorities. Lawmakers are considering a new statewide insurance exchange program in accordance with the recent federal reforms. This program would provide new insurance options to individuals and small businesses. Medicaid applications will also be offered through the exchange. And so if you're, uh, if you're coming, to, if you go into the exchange and you punch in all of your information on your income and, and such, it'll evaluate whether you're eligible for Medicaid or it'll evaluate if you're eligible for a subsidy on your health insurance through the exchange. Now we as a state have the opportunity to develop this at the state level so that the federal government doesn't step in and take it away from us. Creating an exchange is a priority for Governor Haley Barber, but he's among many opponents of President Obama's landmark health reforms. He says they are far too expensive and will have negative economic consequences. If the Obama administration's health care mandates actually go into effect, employers don't know what their costs or responsibilities will be. So it impedes hiring. Also under the public health umbrella, the fate of mental health facilities in Mississippi. More than one in three Mississippians report some problem or issue with their mental health. But the joint legislative blueprint for the 2012 budget calls for a 4.4% cut to the Department of Mental Health. Director Ed Legrand warns that his department cannot afford that cut. DMH says it needs another $20 million to match federal funds for the 15 community mental health centers, and it wants $17 million more to replace lost Medicaid funding from the federal stimulus. Otherwise, DMH warns, more than 100,000 people will feel a direct impact in terms of fewer services and programs for mental health patients. Those are just some of the stakes involved in public health at the state capitol this year. Our guest tonight, Hob Bryan, chairs the Senate's Public Health and Welfare Committee. He is a Democrat representing Itawamba, Lee, and Monroe counties. His colleague, Republican Briggs Hobson, represents Issaquina, Warren, and Yazoo counties. He is vice chairman of the Senate Public Health Committee. From the House, Representative Steve Holland is a Democrat representing Lee County. He chairs the House Public Health and Human Services Committee. And the vice chairwoman of that committee is Omeria Scott. She is a Democratic representative for Clark, Jasper, and Jones counties. And we thank you all for joining us on Quorum this evening. Okay, of course, we want you to join the conversation as well. Our toll-free phone line is now open. Dial 1-877-405-5247 with your questions for our guests. Again, that's 1-877-405-5247. You can also email your questions. The email address is quorum at mpbonline.org. We'll get to as many of those calls and emails as our time allows. And you can join the discussion on Twitter as well. Just add the hashtag quorum 
to your comment and follow us at twitter.com slash MPB online. Uh, Chairman Holland, let me begin with you. Uh, you um, wade through a lot of key health statistics and indicators uh, through the year. How would you evaluate the health of Mississippi at present? Well, I, I'd like to think it's improving, but we've still got a long way to go. Um, obesity really has become our number one problem in the mm. state, and of course, from obesity you get diabetes, hypertension, all of the related illnesses, kidney, renal illnesses. <clears throat> we've uh, we made great strides in the last few years. We put some things, mechanisms in place. We've got a very proactive Board of Health, a very proactive uh, health officer at this point that is uh, providing a lot of leadership uh, to the legislature and to the citizens of the state of Mississippi to get in motion, to stop smoking, uh, to do some of those things that will improve all of our health, unquestionably. Uh, Representative Scott, there's often a, a racial divide in the field of public health. Black Mississippians suffer a greater incidence of, of some of the things that Representative Holland mentioned, uh, diabetes, heart disease, cancer, other serious medical conditions, and it, it, it strikes at all ages. Uh, what particular obstacles do minority residents face in terms of health care in Mississippi? Well, certainly I think probably the most critical need for minorities is to have people really of the same culture providing some of the health care. Yeah. Uh, when you go to a person that you have a comfort level with, like many women prefer to go to a woman uh, for their GYN services, then you tend to get, I think, a better outcome. And so that is why we're trying our very best to steer more young people into science, into mathematics, so that we can get more, particularly African Americans, in the healthcare field. We feel like if we can get more African Americans in the healthcare field, living in the community, t make, talking about making healthy choices, then we'll be able to make a difference. Hmm. Uh, Senator Ryan, what do you think are some of the, the other sort of criti uh, critical points of, of health care? We mentioned obesity, some of the others. The overwhelming problem is poverty, and mm. so many of Mississippi's problems revolve around that. Uh, generally speaking, more affluent people have more access to health care. Generally speaking, more affluent people have more uh, information about health care and lead healthier lives. That's obviously not true with every individual in every situation, but one of the reasons Mississippi shows up so poorly on the statistics is that we have uh, so many poor people living in, in Mississippi and, and trying to raise the e economic standards of the state I think is something that all of us work at constantly and that uh, shows up in, in health care as well. Senator Hobson, some of your thoughts on, on some of Mississippi's critical health problems. Well, I think my colleagues have addressed it quite well. The difference, the one thing that I would add to it is that education plays a part in what we're doing with health care in Mississippi. There are a lot of people that live uh, particularly in rural areas that don't have the education, don't have the ability uh, and haven't learned where to go for certain health care treatment. Uh, I represent an area that's uh, Issaquina County that's as, uh, probably impoverished as any place in Mississippi and, and there are a lot of people that don't have either access to health care or just simply don't have the knowledge of where they need to go for certain types of treatment. Well, I, I address this to anyone here. What, what, what can the legislature or, or what should the legislature do uh, to, to help change this, to help set standards of, of health care and wellness across the state? Well, for one thing, you, you fund Medicaid at the highest level you possibly can. It, it does more to, do, to provide health care needs for our impoverished people than any other program that we have. And, of course, Mississippi is gifted and, and blessed by God's uncommon favor through the federal government to get the highest match ratio, FMAP, federal match ratio in the nation. We put up basically a quarter and we get 75 cents back from 49 other states in health care. That generates untold millions of dollars of economy for the state of Mississippi, number one, but more basic health care for people. It provides access, provides availability. Uh, without it, uh, I can't imagine where we would be. So I think that's one of the big things always. And we get attacked these days for trying to support Medicaid, but uh, some of us have fought a diligent fight and will continue to do so to the bitter end. Representative Scott, what else can the legislature do to help address some of these health concerns? Well, I'm very interested in creating career ladders uh, in nursing. Mm -hmm. Again, when you, the senator was talking about Issaquina County, where I don't even think they have a practicing physician. Right. 
where we've got to go into these areas where we lack uh, the ability to really have access to health care and try to build people at the ground level. And the best place to start is to try to steer people into nursing. So I've introduced a bill that would work with TANF mothers, these are people that are on welfare, to move them to self-sufficiency. We want to put them in a vocational one-year program where they can become practical nurses. Then they get into the career of nursing, go up the career ladder, the next step, registered nurse, then they can get their BSN and, and eventually become a nurse practitioner. We're doing two things. We're taking people off of welfare, making them more productive, and we're addressing this accessibility issue for health care. I think it's a great thing, and I hope that the legislature will uh, embrace it. All right. Well, lawmakers recently heard evidence of a widespread problem in our state, teen pregnancy. A state health department <coughs> survey finds that about 76% of high school students have had sex at least once, and almost 45% of them reported having sex within the previous six months. This frequent sexual activity is one big factor behind Mississippi's teen pregnancy rate, the highest rate in the nation. There is a House bill that would require school districts to implement a sex-related ed, sex, uh, sex education curriculum. It calls for a focus on either abstinence or an abstinence-plus approach. Uh, Senator Bryan, these um, bills have proven difficult to, to gain momentum uh, in recent years. What do you think uh, will be different about this session, or will it be any different? If the House passes a bill and if it comes to public health, we'll take the bill up and consider it. I have no idea where the votes are. I'm not very good at predicting how people are going to vote these days. Uh, anyone else have any uh, thoughts on, uh, on this particular <laughs> legislation? It seems to generate a lot of response and a lot of uh, thoughts, but it doesn't get very far. Well, it's fairly visceral, for one thing, uh, depending on where you feel on the issue, where you fall on the issue. Uh, I, I really think the House is pretty serious about uh, putting together a program on this. We've got a bill out on the calendar, I believe, that will address this, not only abstinence, but ab abstinence plus, which I think you've got to do. I think we've got to, got to get our head out of the sand in Mississippi and be realistic. Number one, the, the most cohesive social element we have in the state of Mississippi, such as it is, is the public school system. Hmm. Now, that's just a fact of life. Families are dysfunctional. Families are split and divided. And, and there is a lack of, of responsibility there. We hear a lot about parental responsibility, but when parents are, are, it's one parent, usually a mother in the home, it's not a very stable situation to educate these kids. So I think we're gonna have to get serious in the public school system. And I think our bill provides for six pilot projects across the state. Uh, to teach abstinence plus, and I'm hoping we can get that through. You know, as Senator Bryan said, you never know when a bill hits the floor of the House. I mean, we've got some people who think that's an absolute taboo, taboo subject and should not even be discussed by any political body. Uh, I happen to be one of those that disagrees. Well, you mentioned abstinence and abstinence plus. Explain what abstinence plus is for folks who aren't familiar with. with well, that's that's concept. teaching more than just not having sex. It's it's teaching that if you've got if you're going to have sex, there's a responsible way to do that. Uh, it would include the whole gamut of of lifestyle education, uh, probably through school nurses, which is another way, by the way, that we have strengthened health care in the state. We've really beefed up the school nurse program around our public schools in the state of Mississippi, and I think it's going a long way to helping in that. But uh, abstinence plus is a broader model mm -hmm. than just saying don't have it, because obviously the statistics bear out, no matter how much we teach don't have it, it happens. We have a caller on the line with a question now, Keisha from Leland. Keisha, go ahead with your question, please. Keisha, are you there? Uh, we lost Keisha, but uh, Keisha, call back and we invite anyone to call. I will flash the number on the screen periodically through the program and you can uh, join in the program with us. Uh, Representative Scott, you've authored a bill that makes uh, a birth control, abstinence, parenting classes all uh, mandatory for teenagers who receive Medicaid or other state support. Uh, what do you think of the prospects for that bill and why did you author it? Well, the prospects for it should be good. 
we've we've led the nation in the last uh, eight out of the last ten years in teenage pregnancy. We lead the nation uh, in sexually transmitted diseases. We're the poorest state in the union. So we need to be getting serious about trying to change lives and change lifestyle choices. So we have people who are participating in certain programs that are sponsored by the state of Mississippi. And I think that if you're participating in a program that the taxpayers pay for and you have uh, fathered a child or you have conceived a child, then I think the only responsible thing for us to do is to provide parenting skills for you, to talk to you about abstinence, to give you counseling on birth control and abstinence plus, and try to help you to make better decisions as you move forward. I think we have a responsibility to do that. And I'm hoping that we will have a candid discussion now about trying to really make a difference uh, in people's lives. We don't want people to remain on welfare. We don't want people to remain in poverty. And we're, our, our children are making a lot of bad decisions, and it's time for us to now to intervene. Senator Thompson, what do you think of this idea of, of requiring these services for uh, folks who are on, uh, on some sort of uh, assistance? Well, I'm not sure about a requirement. I think that there's, again, going back to education, I think we need to do more to educate our citizens about the various things that are offered to help them learn uh, how they can better themselves and better their families. Uh, you know, we talking about the sex education issue, you know, that's one thing that a lot of people are very sensitive about, and I respect that, and I think that our public schools would be uh, a place that sex education could be offered, but every parent would have a right to determine if they want their child to participate in that. Uh, I don't want to force anybody else's child to part participate in sex education. The parents may feel more comfortable about uh, talking to their children and, and handling that themselves. Other parents don't want to deal with that and they can allow the schools and people that are properly trained to take that responsibility. But any way we handle it, I think these kind of issues we need to be very sensitive about. Uh, we need to have the parents involved as much as possible and in public education. And I don't mean just the public education system, I mean more than that public education is the way that we can reduce some of these uh, teen pregnancies and sexually transmitted diseases and some of the things that we deal with in Mississippi that are a tremendous strain on our budget and a tremendous strain on the resources that we as uh, legislators have to help make our state uh, function properly. We have a caller on the line now, I believe Cleophas from uh, Kosciuszko. Go ahead with your question, please. Sir. Uh, yes, my question is this. Uh, like we have test, the mandatory testing. Why don't we put PE on mandatory testing? And that way every year our kids will be tested and we'll see how they're doing. And we'll see how they're losing weight or how they're being overweight. Uh, uh, we don't touch it. We have schools, believe it or not, now I know you just sound silly, but we have schools, believe it or not, don't even let their kids go out for recess because they're so concentrated on the test. So won't we put PE on the test to make sure our kids get tested? Thank you. It's an interesting thought, pretty uh, mandatory PE on testing to see how folks are, how the kids are doing uh, physically. Anybody want to uh, speak to that? Well, I can tell you I'm a big advocate of physical education in the school system. When I was coming through, it was a mandate and we had to do that. And it not only uh, gave us physical activity, but I think it brought us together in a setting outside the classroom that was wholesome. I don't know about the tests on it. That's a new thought and a twist <laughs> on it to me. but. Uh, uh, by golly, we need physical education in every school system in this state. It works. All right, let's move on and let's consider the situation at the State Division of Medicaid. It's a critical organization for hundreds of thousands of Mississippians now. Medicaid officials say that number could swell past the one million mark if a state insurance exchange program pulls more people into the system. Governor Haley Barber has called in the past for streamlining Medicaid's operating budget and in last month's State of the State address, he applauded the division's progress. Last week, I announced that the Division of Medicaid appears to be on track to run a surplus of 40 to $50 million this year, probably because of less utilization and projected. But I do want to congratulate the Division of Medicaid for an outstanding job of managing this enormous program and of controlling its enormous costs. 
Well, the governor also congratulated two of our guests, Steve Holland and Hob Ryan, for working with him to redirect those Medicaid savings. So, Senator Bryan, how will that 40 or so million dollars be spent in the 2012 fiscal budget? Well, I, I don't know of anything I disagree with Governor Barber about more than the notion that the Department of Medicaid is doing a good job because they're holding down spending. They're holding down spending because they're denying services to sick people. Uh, the governor, by way of example, has in instituted a, pr a program which requires every child to uh, sign up every year with a face-to-face -face meeting with a representative from the Division of Medicaid. Well, many children are in families where their parents don't, don't uh, tend to things as well as they should, and there are large numbers of children that are taken off the rolls because they don't meet this face-to-face -face requirement. Then the next time they get sick and go to the doctor, they have to go get recertified to be on Medicaid when they were on Medi they were eligible all along. Uh, that's one of the one of the ways of denying services. But you notice the governor's entire uh, uh, measure of how well the division of Medicaid was doing is how much money are they spending? No concern at all about are they doing a good job of taking care of sick people? Are they spending money efficiently? Or or we anything. It was just simply a question of how much money are they spending. That is the sole criterion between uh, the, where the Department of Medicaid is measured, and that's very, very sad, and I think that's very wrong. Senator Hobson, one, um, excuse me. Well, I was going to say one of the problems we were discussing earlier about health care in Mississippi and Mississippians being unhealthy, one of the ways to save money in the health care system is to go more upstream, and I think we're going almost to the, the, the as far upstream as we could go when we were talking about the need for education and improvement in the economy as a method of, of, of uh, winding up with better health statistics. But then you've got prevention in the largest sense of the word, beginning with healthier living, healthier lifestyles, and on and on. But one of the things that happens, one of the reasons that we have high cost of medicine in this country is people who are uninsured, people who don't have enough money to go to the doctor, don't go to the doctor when they need to. And they put it off and put it off and put it off and then finally show up at an emergency room when it's extremely expensive to take care of them and they're in an emergency and, and, and need to be cared for. The, the, the way you save money is not denying services to people. It's moving farther upstream and catching people when, when they have uh, the beginnings of a health problem and dealing with it then rather than later. I could, I could go on and on giving examples of, of how that's occurred. But. Well, Senator Hobson, your reaction to that, because there's, is it all about the money and, and denying services in order to save the money, or is Medicaid doing a good job of well, streamlining? I, I think Medicaid's doing a pretty good job. I would disagree with my, my colleague, Senator Bryan, a little bit on the fact that they're trying to weed people out of the system. I think. Uh, we have a responsibility, uh, the state departments have responsibilities to make sure that uh, the monies that they're spending are being spent wisely. And there's some people that, frankly, if they come in for the next year to check in, they've either got a job and got the money to pay for the services or they've got health insurance through another uh, means, through their employer, uh, and which brings up the health insurance exchange that I would like to get to at some point tonight. But there, there are reasons to have people come in and check periodically to make sure that they're uh, that they need to be on Medicaid or don't need to be on Medicaid. So uh, I would disagree in that sense. But I do agree with Senator Bryan that uh, one of the big problems that, we've ha that we have in this state and really nationwide is that we have too many people that are uninsured. Uh, we do have a large Medicaid role, but there are a lot of people that have no insurance uh, and they have to go in and get treatment and usually it's at the ER because that's the only place they can get into and ERs are required to take them in. Uh, and it's a tremendous strain on our medical um, uh, our medical providers in the state and, and the cost of other services then go up because they have to pass those costs along to other patients and so it just creates this massive um, amount of dependency on federal and state monies. Well I would say there's no question that people who are not eligible for Medicaid should not be on the program. The governor has complete control of the agency. The governor can do anything he wants to to investigate and see if people are eligible to be on Medicaid or not. I don't think the legislature has ever turned down any request from Governor Barber or any other, go any other governor to have uh, uh, whatever sort of investigators or anything that Medicaid needs to make sure that people who are not eligible are not on the program. But the, the difficulty is this face-to-face -face recertification, which no other state in the union has is inefficient, 
it's not doing a very good job of weeding out people that are not supposed to be on, on the system. It is doing, however, having the result of weeding out people who are eligible. And, and there's no question about uh, whatever we need to do to make sure that the, that the ineligible people are not getting benefits. We'll cooperate with the governor any way in the world on that one. Uh, Representative Holland, you've made it clear on the committee level that you don't care for Medicaid's executive director, uh, B Bob Robinson. He's, he's, a governor's, he's the governor's appointee. Uh, what is your criticism of, of his work? Well, uh, you know, <clears throat> it's somewhat personal, but more so, it, I think Senator Bryan has capsuled it perfectly. Uh, we, we don't have to go back until the, just the beginning of the Barber administration when 65,000 people were kicked off the rolls very unnecessarily and very erroneously. And we've had this attitude of government less and Medicaid. Uh, Medicaid is, again, is not only the most fabulous health care program that we have in this state, uh, it generates more money to the general populace than any other than any other program that we have. The economic factor of it is unbelievable. I have I have face to face looked at so many children, Down syndrome children that are being somewhat picked on right now by the division because of allegedly we're not following some federal law, which I've yet to understand uh, because this is the first administration that's ever brought that up. We haven't had a problem with that since uh, Katie Beckett Children, Disabled Children at Home was brought into the, the fore in about 1990. Uh, th this administration just wants to say no to the poor, the disenfranchised, and, and the uh, disabled in our state, and especially, it seems like now, children of all categories. And it just breaks my heart, and I, I, think, uh, I think the governor, through his will and pleasure appointee, probably got uh, his most astute battle axe to take care of a program that should benefit, that does benefit the most Mississippians, and should be the most generous program that we got, and I just have a personal conflict with him about his attitude toward uh, people that are hurting and that are sick, and it, it, it manifests itself in committee, and, and so I just made the call as chairman of the committee that I'd be glad to hear from any of his staff, but I don't need to hear from him anymore. I think, I think the Down syndrome situation is one example which sort of explains what we're talking about. There's a program under which parents who have children who suffer from Down syndrome can get some, have Medicaid pay to help them with some of their additional expenses for caring, caring for their children at home. Generally speaking, up until this point, Medicaid has tried to find a way to cover people under the notion that we would like to actually help families who have children with Down syndrome and, and have the additional expenses and all that that incurs. A, about a year ago, just out of the clear blue sky, the Division of Medicaid suddenly reinterpreted the rules, reinterpreted rules in a far more restrictive way than they'd ever been interpreted before, and announced to large numbers of parents who had been getting help caring for their children that suddenly they'd been cut off. And you know, that just isn't what I think we ought to be doing, and there are examples like that over and, and over again. But let me say this to you, Senator. Now, on the, and I'm not taking up for the governor or the division of Medicaid because everything that you've talked about tonight, you know I was against when others supported it. But with the Katie Beckett program, which is the public needs to know, that it's a, it, there is no income limit. So you could be a millionaire on the Medicaid program. And so my constituents whose children age off from 180% and then at five years old to 150 percent, and then at 13 years old to 100 percent of the federal poverty level, they have to get off the program. These are single mothers, some of them working 20 hours a week, and it's very difficult to explain to them that you can have a millionaire whose child, and I'm, I would like to see everybody have it, but it's, it's difficult to explain to people that you have these categories of eligibility and you have this category that there's no limit in income but then you have people who are very poor <clears throat> that can't access health care now I'm again I'm not trying to take up for the governor because I think with a 40 million dollar surplus we should take care of these people well, I, I can assure you the Down syndrome children that have been removed from the rolls don't have parents who are, who are millionaires. Yeah. I didn't say oh, that sorry. they did, Senator. I said that, that 
there is no income limit. And, and all of the other categories of Medicaid eligibility have various income li limits at the federal poverty level. That's, that's what I said. Well, and let me, let me share this. We keep talking about 40 to $50 million. It's $73 million is what the figure is of the surplus in Medicaid. And you can talk about conservative management, and, and you can wave your flag that it's certainly been conservative management. But the bottom line at the end of the day is exactly what Senator Bryan said. Who's getting health care and who's being denied health care? Right. And that should be the litmus test, nothing else. Well, again, this is such a false issue because we're talking about this additional money in, in the Medicare budget. Most of that money is there because Congress passed a law which in, enhanced the money Mississippi got for another period of time. That's In other true. words, we got money to help defray the cost of Medicaid. It was, it was budget neutral. What the Congress did was, number one, they closed a loophole where foreign corporations weren't paying their fair share of the income tax. So they, they increased, they, they closed this loophole on foreign uh, corporations that got some <laughs> revenue from that. They also reduced the length of time people could be on, on food stamps. And the, 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 the uh, money from that came to the states in the form of enhanced uh, Medicaid uh, uh, reimbursement level. I want to make it clear the governor was opposed to that. The governor's position is that money should not be where it is now in the general fund of Mississippi. It should be up in Washington, and it should still be in the pockets of the foreign corporations enjoying their tax cuts. I mean, I, I just... And, and Steve and I work with the governor and people on his staff on public health issues we have for years. We're on the same side of, of many, many issues. And I would say, Steve, we all have a good working relationship, I so. but I just don't know of anything that I, I think the governor is more off base about than, than his comments about the Division of Medicaid. You are watching Quorum on MPB Television and mpbonline.org. We hope you'll call in with your questions. The toll-free phone number, 1-877-405-5247. You can also email us at quorum at mpbonline.org or follow us on Twitter. And if you are an educator, look for the Quorum page on our website, mpbonline.org. We have an education resource and activity guide for your classroom use. We'll continue the discussion now. Senator Bryan, in terms of uh, care for, uh, for mental health, there's a lot of talk about the, the 15 uh, community mental health centers in Mississippi. What are they and what, what, do, what services do they provide? The show's only one hour long. <laughs> <laughs> and we're down to 30 we'll, minutes now. We all have to summarize. Um, we have a de Department of Mental Health, which basically, not exclusively, but basically uh, runs institutions, Whitfield, East Mississippi State Hospital, mm -hmm. places like that, although they have some services that are not institutionalized. Uh, there are 15 community mental health centers across the state. They each uh, are, are composed of several counties. They each have a board chosen from the several counties. They get some money from local governments, but m most of them get an awful lot of money from Medicaid. The community mental health centers are the method of delivering care in the community. Everybody I know of agrees that what we need to do is try to move people out of institutions and provide resources where people can be cared for at home. Mm -hmm. It's cheaper, it's, it's better for the individuals, and it's just, there's, there's a consensus that that's what we need to do. The difficulty is you can't send people home from the state hospital unless there's services at home uh, to take care of them. Um, so what the, one of the efforts we're having is to try to make sure that there is some core level of mental health services available in every county in the state because as you go, as you might imagine, from one community <coughs> mental health center to another, the, the services that are available vary greatly and we're, we're working with that. You did that in, I believe, a minute and a half. Less, th <laughs> less than an hour. I'm, I'm uh, we have another caller on the line, Ms. Smith from Pattison. Go ahead with your question, please. Ms. Smith, are you there? Go ahead with your question, please. My question is for, for Representative Scott. I think she mentioned earlier in the program about a um, 
proposal she has for nursing school for some underemployed or unemployed citizens. I just wanted her to elaborate more on it and tell me or tell the audience more about it because my main question is if a person is already has a degree and is underemployed at the poverty level, would they still be eligible for going to nursing school? Well, what we're trying to achieve, again, is two things. We're trying to address the uh, accessibility of health care professionals. And then we're trying to help people who are unemployed and underemployed to become gainfully employed and productive. And we think with this profession, uh, this is the best way to do it. Now, in Mississippi, uh, the economists, they did a study over at IHL, and it shows that we are vested more in manufacturing than, uh, than the national average uh, is, uh, is there. Where we're not invested is in health care and in professional and business uh, services. So we really need to work to get more people involved in those two areas. For this lady, uh, we're asking for two things. We want the Mississippi Employment Security Commission to look at putting back in place what they had before, an individual referral program, which would be available for dislocated workers, that's someone who's laid off or underemployed, also for people who are at the poverty level, at 2A eligibility, where that they could go to school, get the one-year subsidy, help them with their books and their tuition to go to school and become a practical nurse. We also want to take these TANF people who are a different population who will need a good deal more support and put them in an institutional training program. So we take people with like problems, we put them together, we create a nurturing system where they can support each other, and we train them in a career that we know they'll be able to make money. So we're hoping that we're going to be able to move forward with these initiatives. We hope that the legislature will embrace them. We know that it will make a difference if we do it. All right, thank you, Representative Scott. Uh, back to the issue of, of, um, of the Department of Mental Health and these community centers. Uh, Senator Hobson, um, the Department of Mental Health has said that the budget cuts could force the closure of some or all of those um, centers. Mm -hmm. So how will the legislature deal with that uh, $37 million request? Well, one of the things I'm most excited about is the Mental Health Reform Act that Senator Bryan has, has filed in the, on the Senate side, and I'm not sure if Senator Holland or Represent, I mean Representative Holland or Scott has filed it on the House side, but uh, since I've been in the legislature, which is my fourth year now, uh, I've had the hardest time understanding the, uh, the convoluted uh, delivery of mental health care in the state of Mississippi, and, and I, that's about as nice as a way as I can say it. We, I think there's tremendous service provided by the mental health people, and I know our community center in Warren County, the Warren Yazoo Mental Health Center, does a terrific job. But it is so hard to understand the system of mental health in Mississippi. It's so confusing, and I have studied it and tried best I can to uh, get a grip on it. I think what we, what we need to do is have a unified system that everybody can understand. Uh, the dollars, we know where the dollars are going. And as Senator Bryan said, we know that we're getting quality care at each place where mental health patients are treated. To me, that's the best thing we can do. Now, this isn't going to happen overnight. Uh, and the unfortunate part is how we're going to plug the gap between now and the time that this gets implemented. Uh, but I have high hopes that in the future for Mississippi, we've got a top-notch mental health system that, that pays employees fairly, that treats patients the way they need to be treated, gets them into the crisis centers or the community mental health centers or the state hospital, as it may be. Uh, that's what I think needs to be done long term. Short term, it's a difficult problem we've got to uh, grapple with, and I think we're just going to do the best we can to make do for the time being. There's, there's the issue that you've asked about a couple times about funding. Uh, we have a situation which I think is frankly bizarre. The uh, community mental health centers are, have, have been putting up part of their Medicaid match. In other words, if, if, if I'm a doctor and I see a Medicaid patient and I send a bill, the Division of Medicaid pays the bill. If that same patient goes to a community mental health center, they send a bill to Medicaid, but they have to send Medicaid the 20 cents or whatever it figures out to, to get a dollar back. They have to put up their own match. 
which, which I think is just irrational. Now what makes it even more irrational is that there is a line item, or has been, in the appropriations bill that's passed for the Department of Mental Health to pay for the Medicaid match for community mental health centers. Well, then when the Department of Mental Health budget gets cut, suddenly the Department of Mental Health doesn't have the money to pay the match, but there is this notion that they have the responsibility to do it. Basically, it's taking $10 million, whatever it is, and spending it twice. And to me, that's irrational. They're like, they should be, the community mental health centers in general terms should be treated like other uh, providers and they should just send a bill in and have Medicaid pay well, it. Well, the House passed that bill just today. As a matter of fact, Chairman. That does what? That does exactly what Senator Bryan says. It makes mental health centers a provider just like any other Medicaid provider in the state. They submit their bills and the Medicaid budget pays it. Uh, and uh, I think that's progress. I really do. Uh, and I hope it goes through the Senate. Uh, Chairman Dito of the Medicaid Committee handled that today on the floor of the House. And, and it was reasonably non-controversial and got a very heavy vote. And I think it's going to go a long way to to bridging the gap that Senator Hobson spoke about in the mental health services. It is tough funding community mental health centers, but you cannot have an institutional system without the community system. It's just a disjoint and it does not work. And so the mental health reform bill that Senator Bryan and our committee members have worked on now for a year and a half probably, I think it's going to go a long way to bridging that. We've had every player in mental health at the table, <clears throat> from the 15 centers to the institutions to the Department of Mental Health to the advocates, uh, all the way through uh, anybody interested. We've had massive hearings on this issue. And it's just going to basically say that every community mental health center shall provide certain base services, like case management, like prescription medication, and managing that medication, which is three-quarters to seven-eighths of the problem. Huh. A lot of times these folks come out of the institutions, get off their medicine, and then they're right back in the institution. It's a revolving door. Yeah. And so uh, we feel pretty positive about that. That'll be probably on our agenda tomorrow, Friday. And, and I think we're going to pass it, and it's going to go a long way. Tell us the status of the Mississippi Health Benefit Exchange Act. That's the health care exchange? Yes. <laughs> well, I haven't been as involved in that. Senator, uh, I can I'll, I'll be happy to talk uh, well, about Senator that if you, if you don't mind, Wilson. Yeah, sure. I've been working on this for since I've been here. you actually serve on the relevant committee. That's right. I, not, I serve on the uh, committee sure. and have been active. Uh, I've been pushing this since I've been in the legislature. And, and I'll tell you one quick horror story, but uh, I'm a business owner, and when I, uh, before I was elected to the legislature, uh, my family was paying, at the time a very healthy family, was paying about 18000 a year in premiums. Uh, and that was not to mention what was paid, uh, that I was paying for my employees and, and other people that were in my company. And, you know, it's just an outrageous amount of money to pay in premiums. And the reason is because I was a small business, small law firm, and insurance companies have, are not as friendly to small law firms when it comes to premiums as they might be to Nissan or, or GE or some big company. Big companies, yeah. And so, uh, what this Health Insurance Exchange Act would do is allow small companies to pool their bar put together their bargaining power and pool their resources to, to get better uh, rates and, and that way you keep more. A lot of small employers are just dropping health insurance for their employees and, and we go back to that same problem of uninsured people in Mississippi. Uh, and that's a, a huge drain on our system. But if we can get together and get reasonable, affordable health insurance rates, I think you'll see small companies keeping the health insurance and offering health insurance to their employees. Uh, and in turn, we'll get medical providers paid, we'll get people off the, the payroll having to go into the ER for medical treatment. Uh, so I, yeah, I think it's a great thing. I hope we can pass it finally and uh, make some progress in Mississippi to keep cost down for small businesses. And does the governor's support help in that effort? Yes, he's, he's been supportive of that from the uh, since I've been in office. All right, we have another well, now, caller. Excuse well, me, go ahead. Now let's be clear. Now the health care exchange program that we're talking about is a result of the health care reform bill. And it was my understanding that we had, uh, the leadership had enjoined itself in a lawsuit to fight the health care uh, reform law. The, the people need to know that what we're entertaining, the health care insurance exchange, mm -hmm. 
Some people call it a f parts of Obamacare. That's what we're entertaining. And the senator uh, articulated it best. Just like the Democrats were saying, <laughs> this is a program that's going to drive down costs and make it where you can have insurance accessible to more people. That's what the senator said, that he's accessible and affordable for more people, in particularly small businesses like what the senator has described. So I think the citizens of Mississippi need to know, because we've had a lot of discussion about that we were not for the health care reform bill, and then it became Obamacare. But in fact, the senator has represented that the governor is in favor of it, he does have a line item in his budget for $1.5 million uh, for uh, the health care exchange program to be enacted. So, I mean, it, it kind of, you get a little bit confused uh, when uh, you, I guess maybe he was against it before he was for it. Maybe well, that's the way we yeah, should you say it. You, you may be speaking for the governor, but I, I've been supporting this. I'm not this. speaking for it. I've been supporting this bef since before uh, President Obama was in office. And, 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 there's, and it's been and a that's, good and I don't idea. Have that to think that's a good part of the Health Care Reform Act, uh, and that is to try to get employers to take up the responsibility for health insurance. Uh, but what I've been supporting was way before the current president was in office and uh, and that was part of the plan, I think, and I'm glad that the Federal Congress and the President saw that that was a very positive thing, not just for Mississippi, but for the entire country. So, and I think the Governor's been supportive of it. I know he was supportive of it three years ago, so um, that was about the time that the President was elected, two years ago. But, uh, so that may, our, not that there's anything wrong with that portion of the uh, Obamacare, if you want to call it, but it's been supported in Mississippi before the current uh, Federal uh, administration was in place. You, right. you, and I think Utah does, but you can have a health care exchange with or without the federal legislation. The problem is until the federal legislation came along, nothing was happening. Yes. And as a result of the federal legislation, now states really are setting up the health care exchanges. So that's happened. But, but since you've raised the issue of uh, health care reform on the, on the national level, I'm sure the bill's not perfect. But there is one key feature which seems to me so obvious. The dilemma that we have in the United States is there are people who do not have health insurance, do not have access to health care, and can't afford it. And, and however imperfectly, what the bill tries to do is to see if there isn't some way to get something approaching health insurance for every citizen. And they do it in a number of ways. The health care exchange working through small businesses is one step in that direction. Subsidies for small businesses, because right now, it, it, it's, it's frustrating to me that health care is associated with your job. No other country in the civilized world, no other country in the uncivilized world has a system like that, but that's the system we've got and it's too far gone to change. But one of the problems is if I'm a employer and I have an identical competitor, I'm providing health care and my competitor's not, I'm at a competitive disadvantage with the other guy. And the other guy is, is having uninsured people are not paying his fair share of the cost of the system. So this is an attempt to, to try to level those situations. All right, let's go to the phone lines now and uh, check in with Martha from Hattiesburg who has a question for us. Martha, go ahead with your question, please. Yes, I agree with uh, Senator Bryan on a lot of issues because of just common sense. Back in the 70s, what happened to the program where you get on Medicaid, you get all the assistance that you need? I'm speaking from a single parent position now. You get all the assistance that you need, and they work with you to get off the system. Right now, it seems like they, they work against you more so than working with you to get off the system um, before, you know, they want you off before you even get a good start good. Like I said about the research, the recertification face-to-face -face yearly, we need a pro something in place as soon as possible for people to be able to um, have more than just that one face-to-face, -face, the kapoos they off, the kids are off. Hmm. Uh, so does Medicaid do an adequate job of, of, of 
uh, of helping people get, uh, I guess, get self-supporting? Well, I think the caller makes a point, which I think all of us agree with, that is long-term, the solution to many of Mississippi's problems is improved economic development, an improved economy, and if, if we were a wealthier state, then we would be better off in a whole number of areas, and I, I think that's the point. Well, I think the division in this administration, uh, it, it's not uh, innuendo, it's fact. Uh, they did not reapply for a $1 million Robert Wood Johnson grant for outreach, for example. It was ours. They just didn't apply. There's just been no reaching out to try to improve, really, in the in the micro, the lives of Mississippians health through the program. It's been it's been to contract it in, and to squeeze it and make it a dollars issue instead of a health care issue. And I just I, I feel like I've got the right to take issue with that, and that'll be gone hopefully in about 11, 12 months when this administration's gone. I hope. Well, here, here's an example, and it, it's a real-world example. It doesn't involve Medicaid, but it's, it's the principle we're talking about. Uh, there's an individual who was on Medicare, and his wife was on Medicare, and his wife was sick. In fact, she had diabetes and needed to go to the doctor. He was completely impoverished. He could not afford to pay the copay to go see the doctor. and, and came to see me and, and I eventually said, you go take your wife to see that doctor. That doctor will see your wife. The doctor will be paid something for Medicare, but, but I can tell you the condition she's in and knowing the, the relative affluence of the area and all the doctor did, and in fact the doctor did see his wife. But he was sitting there not, go, not taking his wife, who desperately needed medical care, to the doctor because he couldn't afford to pay the copay, and he was embarrassed and didn't think that was the right thing to do. In, in fact, I believe the doctor was, was happy to see him under those circumstances. But, but those examples of people who need health care but are not receiving it crop up over and over again, and those, that's one of the problems that Steve and I are talking about. We have an email question now. This is from Lisa in Starkville, and she asked this. Given the scientific evidence that tobacco smoke causes immediate and long-term harm in non-smokers and the overwhelming support for the smoke-free bill introduced by Senator Bryan, what do you think it will take to have the Senate repair the damage done to this bill in committee and enact a strong law that protects all Mississippians in indoor public places? As a mother of a one-year-old, I'm hopeful that my daughter will grow up with less exposure to tobacco smoke than I have had. Senators? If there's that overwhelming support for the bill, it was not made evident in the committee vote. Mm. I think that's a fair assessment. <laughs> um, you know, I think the argument has been by many people that it's infringing upon the, the property owner's rights to do with his business, his or her business, as he, please, he or she pleases. Now, um, you know, I d I've got concerns about businesses that um, cater to children, you know, restaurants and, and grocery stores and other places where uh, children don't have a choice and, and they have to get dragged in. If, they're only, if you're in a small town and there are two restaurants and both restaurants are smoking, a child's not going to have a choice if they want to go out to dinner. Uh, or if their grocery store is the only game in town and, and the child has to get taken there. Now, if you're 21, uh, I can understand the argument a little bit better. If it's a casino or a bar or some place that children are not permitted, um, and, and adults choose to go in there and they're 21 and make that decision, that's a different story. But I, I don't know, Senator Bryan may have a better feel about what the chances are of getting it remedied in the Senate. Well, as I've said earlier, I'm not in the yeah. business of predicting how yeah. the votes will turn out simply because I don't know. Uh, so everyone will know what we're talking about. The bill that I introduced simply banned smoking in all public uh, areas in the state of Mississippi. The committee, after considering several amendments, finally wound up amending it to say that the uh, uh, ban on smoking would only apply to government buildings, which is not much more than existing law. So that's, that's where the issue stands now. I continue to support the bill as introduced, but I don't, I don't know where the votes are. We talked about nurses a, a while ago, and a so-called nurse autonomy bill died in the House Public Health Committee. Uh, it would have deleted the requirement that advanced practice nurses must practice within a collaborative relationship <coughs> with a physician. And a lot of nurses uh, supported this uh, legislation. I'll ask our House members here, what, uh, uh, what happened to that? Well, it did die because of uh, 
a lot of discussion that it brought on, and that discussion ultimately has led to the Board of Medical Licensure and the Board of Nursing getting together and, and, and talking, which is so important in our system. You've got to talk to come mm -hmm. to conclusions and to regulate and to provide the best health care that you can. We've had a situation to where, in my personal opinion, I think uh, uh, there's no, no opinion to it. It's, it's fact. Nurse practitioners have filled so fabulously the void in rural Mississippi where no doctors would go. Uh, I personally am not quite ready and may never be ready for an independent practice for nurse practitioners, but I do think the Board of Medical Licensure has got to get real and they've got to realize that we are Mississippi and that they have got to open up their system more to more preceptors, more collaborative uh, uh, physicians so that these nurse practitioners can be in places where they absolutely want or there's not enough of them to go. And that process is happening. I've been in touch with State Medical and Board of Nursing virtually every day and they're making a lot of progress. Uh, there was a group on my committee that wanted the bill to come on out and stay on the calendar just in case the deals fell through. But uh, as chairman of the committee, I thought it would be better that we let them handle it another year. The legislature will be back. It may be a new legislature next year. Uh, but the legislature uh, comes to Jackson every January. It's interesting about how that happens. Well, uh, uh, But they do, and uh, if it don't work, uh, you know, there'll be a lot of hell raised about it, I can just tell you. The hour has gone quickly, as it does every week. That is all the time we have for tonight. And I'd like to thank our guests, Representatives Omeria Scott and Steve Holland and Senators Hob Bryan and Briggs Hobson. We also thank you for joining our discussion tonight. We'll soon have this edition of Quorum available for viewing online at mpbonline.org. Quorum returns next Wednesday at 7 with a focus on public education and the legislature. How will lawmakers support educators in the coming year? That's next Wednesday on MPB Television. I'm Wilson Stribling. Good night.